Okay, well, let's uh, begin with a reading of the passage we're looking at, and I think you'll see why I read what I read earlier as I read this passage. Galatians 4, verses 21 through 31. And let's not forget that all of these things that Paul has been giving over the last several Lord's Days are really many reasons why they need to continue to hold on to Christ and not listen to the Judaizers. And remember, the Judaizers are Jewish Christians, okay? They're not just the Jews, but they are Jewish, they so-called Christians, who have embraced Christ as the Messiah, Jesus as the Messiah. But I think as a political, military Messiah, so to speak, um, one who is not quite the Savior that he really is, because they believe that they still need to embrace the Jewish traditions to be justified. And part of their motivation is the fact that they didn't want to be persecuted by the Jews. Okay, now, we're going to review all of that in the sermon today and see how it all fits together. But let me read the text here. Tell me, you who want to be under law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. But the son by the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and the son by the free woman through the promise. This is allegorically speaking, for these women are two covenants, one proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For more numerous are the children of the desolate than of the one who has a husband. And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. But as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so it is now also. But what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of a bondwoman, but of the free woman. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our comprehension this morning, but also to our edification. Now, briefly, last week, we saw Paul expressing his love for the Galatians, uh, and we saw it in the way that it moved him to challenge them in, in a variety of ways with the gospel, not to give it up, you know, just to think into the past and what it is that God had, had done for them. And, and again, asking them, do you really want to give this up to go back to what you were before? Now, the first thing he brought up was the fact that God had freed them from slavery to false gods. Now, while they were enslaved to these false gods, as we know, every religious system has, has you working to try to earn the approval of this God, even though they're really just idols to begin with. Well, that's what the Galatians were. They are idolaters. Remember that they are the ones that were worshiping the, the pantheon of gods uh, that uh, the Romans believed in. And as Paul was there and preached, uh, they needed to turn away from these things. Well, the Lord had freed many of them, and he asked the question then, do you really want to become enslaved again to another works-based religion? And that's what they would be doing if they went the way of the Judaizers, basically the same thing they were doing when they were pagans. That religion, he reminded them, can't save you, only Christ can. Secondly, he reminded them of the many things that he had suffered to bring the gospel to them. And again, I would remind you that uh, Lystra is in southern Galatia, and it's believed that this is what Paul is referring to uh, when he's writing to the churches of Galatia. It's, the, you know, Lystra, Iconium, and so forth. That is where he was stoned by the Jews for preaching that Jesus was the Christ. He had made this sacrifice uh, for the Galatians. Remember that they, the Jews who won the crowd over 
They stoned Paul. They dragged him out of the city. They left him there for dead, and then Paul got up and went back into the city. Well, a church was planted there. Perhaps this is the illness Paul was referring to when he said it was because of an illness that I preached the gospel to you and spent so much time with you. Uh, well, he had made this sacrifice for them. And he was saying, have I done all this for nothing? You know, brought you this gospel at such a great cost, are you going to throw it now all away? Paul reminded them next that, that he had set aside the Jewish traditions when he originally came to minister the gospel to them. Remember Paul, his philosophy of ministry was becoming all things to all men so that by all means he might win some. Well, when he did that, he was showing them by his own example that these traditions were not necessary for salvation. So he pled with them, become as, as, uh, as I am because I have become as you are. All you need is the Lord Jesus Christ. He next pointed out that, you know, reminded them of how much they had loved him, how much they had cared for him. Remember, he said that, you know, if, if it would have helped me, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me, you know. And again, we, we looked a little bit at that, and perhaps he suffered an eye injury, uh, maybe from the stoning, okay. But such love they had for him. And now they were treating him as an enemy. And why? because he was telling them the truth, because he was trying to bring them back to Christ, trying to secure their future, trying to make sure they were safe. And then finally, he contrasted the Judaizers and their motives with his own. They were attacking Paul. They were attacking his position, faith in Christ alone, so that the Galatians would turn away from Paul and begin to look to them as the spiritual gurus, as, as the leaders, as those that have the key uh, to the kingdom of heaven. So they wanted the Galatians to esteem them. But Paul, his motive was love. He was simply trying to get them to follow Christ. So again, all these different ways in which Paul is trying to stir them up, trying to remind them, trying to show them why they need to hold on to Christ. Well, this morning, he continues with another challenge. Actually, I should say challenges. This time from the law, you know, which they seem so highly, they wanted to esteem so highly. They want to be under the law? Well, listen to the law. But then he also gives a, another challenge or another argument from the prophets. And, and that's not clear, but it will become clear as we look through this passage. So first of all, he challenges them from the law in verse 21. He begins, tell me. You who want to be under law, do you not listen to the law? If you want to be under the law, you should listen to what it says. Well, what is he talking about? He's not talking about the moral law here, and not even not necessarily the ceremonial law, but he's talking about the law as a part of Scripture, okay? The, the portion of the law written by Moses, the Pentateuch. And that's where we find this account. It is in the law. That's the part of the Bible you find this. And this is the account, verse 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. Now, if we had had time this morning, we'd go back to Genesis 16 where we would read that when it didn't seem as though God was going to fulfill his promise to give Abraham a son, Sarah talked him into taking Hagar, her slave, as a wife, that through her, God's promise might be fulfilled. And we know what the result of that was. Ishmael, the one that Paul calls the son of the bondwoman. But God gave Abraham another son. Okay, 14 years later, he visited Sarah as he had promised she gave birth to a son, Isaac, and he is the son of the free woman. Now, Paul wants us to notice first how it is that these children came about, okay? Verse 23, but the son by the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and the son by the free woman through the promise. Ishmael was not the fulfillment of God's promise. He was Sarah and Abraham's attempt to fulfill God's promise through their own wisdom, through their own ability, through their own 
flesh. Now, I think we can relate to Abraham and Sarah because we too also fall, as they do. Sometimes we get impatient with God fulfilling His promise. We pray and we want God to answer that promise right away. And when He doesn't, we try to push, okay? We push to try to get what it is we're asking for. And if we're not going to get it from Him, we try to get it some other way. Maybe it, a spouse, maybe children like Abraham and Sarah, maybe employment, maybe finances, health, whatever it might be. And so we take matters into our own hands. But we need to remember, first of all, from this example, that God is faithful. God will do everything He has said He will do. He has promised to provide everything that we need in the Lord Jesus Christ, but He will do it in His way and in His time, and His time will always be perfect. As we know, His answer will always be the best. Whenever we jump the gun, we get into trouble. <laughs> That's what happened to Abraham, right? That's what happened with regard to Ishmael. Let's not forget, besides what happened in the text that we read, the Ishmaelites became a thorn in the flesh to the children that came out of Isaac. Now, Isaac was the fulfillment of God's promise. Okay, when Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90, both of them be well beyond the years of childbearing, God gave them another son. Now, He had promised the son years earlier, remember, but He purposely made them wait. Why? Why did He make them wait so long? It's because He wanted them to be thoroughly convinced that it was beyond their ability to have a child. I mean, they became convinced it was. That's why Sarah did what, what she did. It was also meant to test their faith. Are they going to trust God or not? Well, Sarah didn't, and apparently Abraham didn't either, and that's why Ishmael was born. But this is why God does not answer our prayers right away. This is why He doesn't give us immediate gratification, which is kind of what the society uh, trains us to, to want. God wants us to learn patience. He wants to test us so that we will learn to trust Him, because the more we trust Him, the more we will be like the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so here we have these two children, one born of Abraham and Sarah's efforts, and the other one born of the promise of God. Now, from this account, <clears throat> Paul draws an analogy between that situation and the one the Galatians were in, and we see that in verses 24 through 26. He says, this is allegorically speaking. For these women are two covenants, one proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now, this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children, but the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. Okay. Well, all right. What does that mean? Okay. Well, the first thing we need to understand here, I think, is this, is that the word allegory is really not the best word to translate what it is that Paul means, what he's doing right here. The word really should be understood as analogy, okay? There's, there's a difference between allegory and analogy. An allegory is when you take the words, take certain words, well, the account of, of um, what, what we just read about. That, that means one thing, and then you understand it or you find in these words or concepts some kind of a hidden meaning, some kind of a spiritual truth. You know, earlier in church history, there were several levels of interpretation, and the, the superficial one was the literal interpretation. Well, you know, anybody can understand that, although not always. But when you get to the allegorical interpretation, you know, you're, you're getting deeper into the meaning and only a certain few people can actually find that out. Well, we need to understand something. First of all, there's nothing wrong with using allegories to teach biblical truth, okay? You can use allegory to do that. That's what John Bunyan did in Pilgrim's Progress, okay? That's what John Bunyan did in The Holy War, and he did it very, very effectively. C.S. Lewis in the Chronicles of Narnia 
That's also an allegory of the Christian faith. I would say maybe not quite as effective maybe as Pilgrim's Progress, but a lot of people have found a great deal of help in learning things about the gospel from that book. But it would be wrong to interpret the Bible as an allegory. I hope you see the difference. You can make an allegory to teach biblical truth, but you don't want to take the Bible as an allegory, finding hidden meanings that aren't really there. We need to interpret the Bible as we would any other literature. And that means according to its genre. If it's historic narrative, you take it as a straightforward accounting of the facts. If it's prophecy, you understand there's going to be a lot of symbols and images in it. Uh, if it's a letter, you know, you, you understand it as, again, straightforward. It's, you know, the example has been given if, if uh, you found a, a page out of a, let's say, a, a piece of paper on the ground and it had some writing on it, you picked it up and it started with once upon a time, okay? You would then understand what's going to follow differently than if it started off dear so-and-so, you know, because those are signaling two different types of literature and you would interpret it according to the kind of literature that it is. Well, that's the way we need to interpret the Bible. The Bible is not an allegory, okay? Now, analogy, on the other hand, is when you compare two things to show their similarity. You're not saying that this is that, but you're saying that this is similar to that. And that's what, you know, Paul is doing here. L let me give you an example, and because Analogy can be used very effectively, and it's interesting that uh, I still remember the point of a sermon that Greg Hodson preached here years ago because he used an analogy. Okay, he was preaching on the text about the lepers, you know, during, they were outside the city gate of the city of Samaria during the siege of the Arameans and how everybody inside the city and outside the city were starving because they had cut off the supply of food the Arameans had. Well, after he explained what the text actually meant, he drew some useful comparisons, analogies between the leper's situation and that of the unconverted person. Now, these lepers, they reasoned while they're outside the gate. If we stay here, we're going to die of hunger. If we go into the city, we're going to die with the people inside the city. But if we go to the camp of the Arameans, they might spare us and we might live. So in the same way, Greg said, if we do nothing about our sin, about our guilt problem, if we just stay where we are, we'll perish. But if we go to Christ, there is the hope that we will live. And then when the lepers go to the Arameans' camp, remember, uh, they were expecting to find the Aramean army, but what they discovered was they had all fled because God in the middle of the night had caused this noise of chariots and foot soldiers and the Arameans said to Israel has, has hired a foreign army and they're going to wipe us out. So they all ran away and they found all the tents deserted and all the food they left behind and they, they were saved, okay? They, they, they started gathering up this food and eating, but then they began to think, wait a minute, this is a day of good things and we shouldn't keep this good news to ourselves. We need to tell the people of Samaria what has happened. And so they did. And in the same way, he said, when we find Christ through the gospel, that's, that's a good thing, and we shouldn't keep him to ourselves, but go and share the good news with others so that they too might be saved. Now, again, this is not what the Lord was teaching in that passage. You know, we really don't have time to get into what he really was teaching, but we can see how that analogy kind of gives you a picture of, of the gospel. Now, that's what Paul is doing here. He's making an analogy. He's not telling us that, you know, that what, well, what he's telling us is not what these events actually meant. He's just simply showing us a similarity between those events and that of the Galatians' current situation. So we read in a lexicon, which is called the Laonida lexicon, that Paul's words should be translated in this way. This incident can be taken as a kind of likeness. So here are two Greek, well, two Greek scholars 
who know the language and are saying, this is really what is behind the word, even though in the Greek, it's actually the word from which we get the word allegory, okay? But the meaning of the word is this is a likeness. So what is it that Paul wants us to see? Well, first of all, he says that these women are like two covenants. And let me make it simple. They're like the covenant of works, okay, where one tries to earn their salvation. And the covenant of grace, where salvation is given as a free gift. Now, Hagar represents the covenant of works. He says in verse 25, now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. I think you'll remember that when um, God brought his people out of Egypt, he brought them to Mount Sinai. That's where he made this covenant the Jews were, thought they were following. That's where he made that covenant with them. Mount Sinai is on the Arabian Peninsula, and that's where Hagar and Ishmael settled. See, that's the connection between Hagar and Mount Sinai. Now, he says Hagar is like the earthly Jerusalem. She's a slave, and her children are slaves. They're, that's what the Jews are, earthly Jerusalem. That's what the Judaizers are. They are like her in that they are slaves, the slaves of sin. Because they're slaves to the law, they're trying to work out their salvation, their righteousness, their justification by keeping the law. They've rejected Jesus, who we know from Scripture is the end of the law, which doesn't mean that, that He's the one who you know, does away with it, but, but He is the purpose of the law. He's the reason why the law was given, to show us what the standard is so that when Jesus kept it, we could see that He can give us that righteousness that the law requires. If they had trusted Jesus, they would have been set free from the law of sin and death to be justified, but because they haven't, they are still slaves, okay? Now, Sarah represents the covenant of grace, verse 26. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. Sarah was not a slave. Sarah was a free woman. She corresponds to the heavenly Jerusalem because her children are free. They're free from the law to be justified or condemned. They become citizens of the heavenly Jerusalem through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, one commentator pointed out something that I thought was kind of interesting, and hopefully it makes sense, but he points out this, you know, when we move from the Old Testament to the New Testament, we move from the earthly Jerusalem to the heavenly Jerusalem, and it's Christ that makes the difference, okay, because He has moved the place where God has placed His name from earth to heaven. When God, first of all, wanted to um, put His name somewhere, He put it in Jerusalem and on Jerusalem. And the way he did it was by the temple, okay? He had them build a house for his name there. But now that Christ, who is the true temple, remember Jesus said, destroy this temple in three days I will raise it up. He was talking about the temple of his body. Now that the true temple has come and that he has completed his work, the efficacy of the earthly temple has been abolished. Remember the veil was torn from the top to the bottom and destroyed in 70 A.D., the, the true temple of God is now in heaven because Jesus has ascended to heaven, to the heavenly Jerusalem, and because we are united with Him through faith in Him, we are the citizens of that city. And that's kind of an interesting thing because we are the temple of God, aren't we? We're the body of Christ. He's the true temple. The true temple is in heaven. And that's what we're a part of. Those who are part of the earthly temple still don't know Christ. They have nothing to do with Him. They're still slaves, but those who have trusted Christ are part of the heavenly Jerusalem, and they are the free citizens of that city. Now, what Paul is asking the Galatians is this. Whose children would you rather be? Those Hagar's children or Sarah's children? Well, if you follow the Judaizers, or any religion that teaches justification by works. You are the children of the bondwoman. You are the slaves to the law. But if you trust in Christ, if you look to Him in faith, you were free from the law with regard to righteousness. 
You are the children of the free woman, the children of promise. Now, <clears throat> that's what the law has to say. Yeah? You, you who want to be under the law, listen to the law. This is what the law says, trust in Christ, be children of the free woman. But Paul goes on now to encourage them also through the prophets. And this is the part that isn't entirely clear and can be quite confusing. Verse 27, he's quoting Isaiah 54, verse 1, where the Lord says this, Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For more numerous are the children of the desolate than of the one who has a husband. Now, what is this talking about? The barren woman here, at first glance, appears to be an allusion to Sarah. I mean, she was barren, right? Desolate, and yet she was going to have many children. So perhaps what's being said here is that as Sarah had faith, faith in the Lord's promise in order to bear a child, so there would be many like her who would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. But what does it mean that um, she remained desolate? No, well, she didn't because God gave her a child. But what does it mean that she didn't have a husband? That doesn't make any sense. For more numerous are the children of the desolate than of the one who has a husband. You see, what this text is saying is that this desolate one who is bearing all these children didn't have a husband, okay? Sarah had a husband. Sarah had Abraham. Hagar had a husband. She also had Abraham. <laughs> Okay, so what's, what is he talking about here? Well, if you go back to Isaiah 54, what the Lord is saying through Isaiah, what he's referring to are the many who would trust in Christ, who would be the children of Sarah, the free woman, in the sense that they had a faith like hers. They would be citizens of the heavenly Jerusalem, but it's referring to the many who would have that faith from the Gentiles as compared to the Jews. You see, the Gentiles were the ones who didn't have a husband. They were desolate because of that. They were without God, without hope in the world. They were unmarried. And as being unmarried, they couldn't bear any children to this heavenly city. They were desolate, okay? Really, the only Gentiles who were saved in, before Christ came were saved by becoming Jews, so they were no longer Gentiles, okay? So they converted to Judaism, either fully or partly, but they had to become a part of Israel's religion. Now, the Jews, on the other hand, they were the ones who had the husband, okay? They had the Lord. Uh, and because the Lord was their husband, there were those that were born to that heavenly city. But as you know from reading the Old Testament, there weren't very many, right? There was only always just a remnant. What the Lord was saying then through Isaiah was this, that He was going to change all of this. He was going to send His gospel to the Gentiles, and many more of them were going to believe. Those who were desolate, there's going to be more children from them, of she who was desolate, who had no husband. The Lord was going to join Himself to, to her, so to speak, to the Gentiles, and there were going to be children born, and many more than from among the Jews. Now, you can imagine how that would strike the ears of a Jewish person. You know, it doesn't surprise us because there's many more Gentiles than there are Jews. And there are many more Gentile Christians than there are Jewish Christians. But it certainly would have surprised them. Now, Paul is pointing to this prophecy because God had fulfilled it and was fulfilling it. They had had no husband before. They had been desolate. But God had reached out to them in His mercy, and He had saved them. And now, they, like Isaac, are children of promise. Being then the children of promise, he's asking, should they turn back to become slaves again? Turn back to their works, turn back to their flesh. God forbid. And God forbid that we should ever do such a thing. Remember, God gave us the book of Galatians to remind us that we need to trust in Jesus Christ and in Him alone in order to be saved, and we should not let anything dissuade us from that truth. Satan is going to try to take it from us by deceiving us, and that's why we need to be absolutely certain what the Word of God says, and we need to hold fast to that. But then, finally, Paul draws one more comparison in this analogy. 
Verse 29, but as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so it is now also. Just as Ishmael, who was born according to the flesh, persecuted Isaac, who was born according to the Spirit. Remember what we read earlier about the feast at Isaac's weaning and so forth and how Ishmael mocked him? So the Jews, the current children of the flesh, were persecuting the Christians, the children of the promise. Now, as I've said before, that is why the Judaizers existed in the first place. They were the Jews that were trying to escape that persecution of the Jewish community. They wanted to appease their fellow Jews by being as Jewish as they could possibly be, while still at least doing lip service to the fact that Jesus was the Messiah. They believed Jesus was the Messiah, but they didn't want to be persecuted, so they embraced Judaism and just kind of added Christ to it. But the problem was they were too Jewish. <laughs> they, they didn't let go of the slavery part of it. They didn't trust in Christ alone. So in that sense, they were still looking to the law as a way to be justified. And that's why, again, they were being persecuted, why the Galatians were being persecuted, and why they were being tempted to fall in with the Judaizers. Now, we're not being persecuted by the Jews, but we need to realize there are, are other children of the flesh out there that are not Jewish children of the flesh, or Judaizers, but still children of the flesh who are persecuting us. Everyone who isn't a believer, you know, the world is persecuting us. And so the question is, how should we respond to that persecution? Because it was making the Galatians want to join the Judaizers to escape it. So how should they respond? How should we respond? Well, we do need to remember, first of all, Paul says, if we capitulate, if we turn to the world, if we blend in with the world, if we become non-offensive to the world, if we compromise our principles and become what the world wants us to be so that they will accept us, well, we have to abandon Christ, right? And if we abandon Christ for the world, we will perish with the world. But if we hold fast to Christ, we will be saved. Okay? Remember, there's different aspects of salvation. We have been saved. We are being saved. We will be saved. We're not in heaven yet. We're in the process of being saved out of this world. I mean, we, we are saved. That's a done deal. We're justified if we're trusting Christ, but we still have this journey to make. If we hold fast to Christ, we will make it to the end. Now, Paul reminds us what the Lord said to Abraham, verse 30. What does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. Sarah sent Hagar and Ishmael away, and God told Abraham, let her do this because I haven't made my covenant with them. My promise is not going to be fulfilled through them, but rather with Isaac. And in the same way the Lord is saying he's going to reject the Jews, he's going to reject the Judaizers, he's going to reject everyone who relies on their works, everyone who does not trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But he will receive everyone who does trust him. So we need to remember who we are. Okay, we are not the children of a bondwoman that's ultimately going to be cast out, but we are the children of the free woman. See, our citizenship is in heaven, in the heavenly Jerusalem. We're no longer a part of the covenant of works, but of the covenant of grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So as the Galatians are being encouraged by Paul to hold fast to Christ and not capitulate to the Judaizers, we need to hold fast to Him. And if we do, we will live. God guarantees it. He will bring us safely to heaven. And he will do it in a wonderful way. So let's bow for just a moment of prayer. And let's, let's thank the Lord that he has made these truths so clear to us. Because these, the gospel is our hope. Christ is our hope. We have no hope outside of him. And we need to make sure that we are always, again, relying on him for that which we need to rely on him for. And that is everything that has to do 
with our justification. When we move into the next section of Galatians, we're going to see how we also need to rest in Christ, trust in Christ for our growth in the image of Christ, for our sanctification. He is our source of justification. He is our source of sanctification. He will give us the ability to, to persevere. He makes us right with God, and He will keep us in that relationship. So, let, let's bow for a moment of prayer.